Hey, Pete. Welcome to the show. Thanks for making some time to be here. Good morning, Trent. Great to be here. So let's start off for the folks who uh, aren't familiar with you. Who are you and what do you do? Sure. I am the CEO of Jazz HR. Um, I am a uh, longtime uh, technology-focused emerging growth company uh, driver. I've been doing that my in, my entire career, which is now uh, longer than I care to admit, but, but let's call it 30 years or so. Um, yeah. And I've been the CEO of Jazz HR for uh, about four and a half years. And your background before Jazz HR, what was the was the startup you were doing before then? Yeah. The so well, well prior to Jazz HR, I was with a company called Carbonite that I did not found, founded by a guy by a guy by the name of David Friend, um, which was a terrific run. Carbonite uh, provides, still provides, uh, online backup for for uh, individuals and for businesses. And uh, we had a terrific run there. I was there for about five years and, and uh, was there when the company was still very small and, and we expanded our target market and, and grew rapidly and went public along the way. So it was a, a terrific run. But I'm now back to more of my entrepreneurial early stage roots, which is more my cup of tea. Yeah. And did something that you learned at the previous company at Carbonite was that the impetus for starting Jazz HR, or how did you come up with the idea? So I did not found Jazz HR. Jazz HR was founded in 2010 by a guy wow. by the name of Don Charlton. Um, okay. um, uh, Don remains on our board to this day, and the business was founded to help small businesses recruit more effectively. And and what was true then is frankly still true today, and that is that most small businesses they obviously have a need to recruit. Um, they have relationships with all the major job boards, whether it's Indeed or ZipRecruiter or CareerBuilder or others. Um, but once candidates are flowing into their business, they typically manage the recruiting process through some hodgepodge of Microsoft Office products, whether it's keeping track of candidates on Excel or in Word, doc, Word documents or inbox management. There's no real efficient process for managing candidate flow through all the steps a business needs to go through uh, in recruiting. And so Jazz HR uh, was founded to solve that problem. Um, and so fast forward uh, about 10 years later, we've got 6,000 small businesses uh, using Jazz HR. They tend to stick with us. So we think we're doing at least a decent job of, of making, helping them recruit uh, more efficiently, uh, more cheaply, which actually saves them money uh, and with a better candidate experience, which results in better hires. So that was the problem the business was founded to address and, and what we still do to this day. Although we've certainly changed a lot over the last 10 years. Oh, undoubtedly. So, and you've been with the company for how long now? Uh, about four and a half years. About four and a half. So when you joined the ship, was there an exercise in, maybe this was done before you got there or maybe you redid it after you got there is where I'm going with this, competitor analysis and positioning? Um, uh, yes, certainly, but our, our primary focus was not on competitors, but on the customer. And, okay. and we spent a lot of time, probably the first six months after our joined, I joined, really focused on product market fit and sort of the classic five questions that the customer facing questions and, and that's, you know, what problem are we solving for who, how many of them are there? Why will they buy and why will they buy from us? And we spent a lot of time thinking through those five questions and, and until we felt comfortable with, with the answers and, the, and, and developing plans behind those answers, we didn't really hit the gas on our new customer acquisition engine. Um, yep. That really kicked off kind of back half of, let's call it 2016. And so while, yes, we certainly pay attention to our competitors and we have good competitors out there for sure, uh, I'm glad we do. It's it's better for customers, and it, and it makes us be better as well. We push them, and I like to think we, um, uh, or, or they push us, and I like to think that that we push them too. But, um, but really, our our primary focus is on customer experience and delivering results for our customers. 
So the fifth of your five questions is the one that I was really kind of digging after because it's an exercise actually that we're performing in my own SaaS company literally as we speak is to answer these five questions. And part of the process, of course, is looking at competitors and what markets are they going after and what's their pricing look like and, and all with an angle of or, or an eye to figuring out what number five, why would they buy from us? Right. So I asked that question largely for selfish reasons because I'm thinking to myself, well, this guy's been through this before. So sure. is there any insight you can share on what, how you arrived at the answer to number five? Why will they buy from Got us? It. Got it. So it's, I mean, what we're really talking about is differentiation, right? Why yep. we have good competitors. I'm sure your business has good competitors, right? Um, yep. How are you different? Why would they pick you over, over someone else? And and we have focused on primarily three things, and it's really the nexus of those three things that that we believe drives new customer acquisition and and ultimately, and perhaps more importantly, customer retention. Um, and that is, um, first, we have a really good product. Um, I would argue our competitors have really good products, but it, it kind of it starts with that. You your product has to um, the product experience, the actual experience once they buy has to, has to meet or exceed the promise made by sales and marketing, right? And that's not true for a lot of companies. There's an old adage that you can sell anybody anything once, but you don't have a business until they renew. And because they're going to buy based on hope, um, or based on promises that sales and marketing made, but they're going to renew based on how the product actually worked for them. Um, and all the great marketing in the world won't help you if the product fails to deliver on its promise. So first we needed a really good product, but that's not necessarily a point of differentiation, but it is clearly table stakes. Um, it's yeah. the ante to get into the game. Um, second thing is we sell to small businesses, many of whom are, are technically inclined and able to navigate their way around an app and, and software and technology and so forth, but many aren't. And, or, or it's not necessarily, not that they can't figure it out, but it's not their primary job. Um, we would argue they shouldn't have to be able to do so. We should make our product so easy to use that, that, it's, it, it, that they don't necessarily have to be technically inclined. And that includes customer support, which is our second point of uh, differentiation really, which is, you're a small business, you've got a question, you shouldn't have to, uh, you, you should be able to call in, you shouldn't have to go through a, a whole ton of different prompts or only be able to look at, at online questions or technical documents. You know, if, if I'm that uh, manufacturing plant manager in Idaho and I, and I just want someone to run a second shift, let me just talk to a human being who can help me write the most effective job description I can or get my job posted in the most effective way or help me understand how automatic uh, interview scheduling works for my hiring team and just explain it to me in English. So our customer support is something we invest in more than our competitors. Um, if you go to any of the, the, the kind of the main three third party software review sites, whether it's G2 or Captera or software advice and read our reviews there, which is from people who are our customers, Every second or third one is going to talk about how helpful our customer support is. And that's something that's really, really important to us. And we think it's a big reason that our customers stick with us. Um, and that starts with the, with the trial experience. If you've got questions, we're there to help. And we make it really, really easy. You can talk to a human being without jumping through hoops to do so. So number one is product. Number two is customer support. We invest in it more than our competitors. We will continue to do so. Um, and then number three is, is price. We unabashedly compete on price. A lot of our competitors are um, two or even three times more expensive than we are. And because of the target market we're going after, small businesses uh, often, you know, these are, are in many cases, you know, sole proprietor businesses where, where every dollar matters uh, to that business owner. And so we have priced, uh, an annual subscription to Jazz HR with small businesses in mind. So where we win, where we differentiate, it's the, it's the combination of best product backed by the, backed by the best support team uh, at a really good price. You can get into Jazz HR for as little as $39 a month. 
um, our competitors uh, can't get anywhere near that. Yep. So. Are you guys funded or bootstrapped? Uh, we're funded. Um, we're venture backed. You are. Yeah. And how long was it the traditional, you know, friends and family and then seed and series A, B, C, D, the usual Correct. path? Correct. And our first primary round really kind of a sort of traditional venture capital um, was in 2014. And then we did another round in 2017. And, and uh, we are likely done fundraising now. Um, the business is performing well. We're, we're running the business at cash flow break even. Uh, we could be cash flow positive, but we're choosing to, to plow every dollar we can back into the business to grow the top line. Um, so uh, I, I suppose never say never, but but our, our plan right now is that we're, we're, we have um, finished raising additional capital. Okay. So now we're going to talk about marketing and customer acquisition. Um, this is going to be, you and I share exactly the same target market, SMB. So this is going to be especially interesting for me, and I'm sure many people in the audience as well. So let's just talk high level first before we go down into the weeds. How do you attract customers? So uh, we bring new customers on board principally through two different means. Um, um, one is direct customer acquisition, where Jazz HR is selling directly to a small business end user customer. Uh, and the second is through channel, um, where we have channel partners that offer Jazz HR to their customers um, uh, and, and for, as, as a way to, to strengthen and deepen their own customer relationships. If, if you're in the HR tech community, whether it's payroll or you're a PEO, or you're an HCM provider, uh, recruiting is important and it's also difficult to do or to do well. So to partner with someone like a Jazz HR, a, a best in class recruiting solution, enables the, our channel partners to both strengthen their, strengthen their relationships with their customers, solve their recruiting problems, but then they also create a recurring revenue stream for themselves as well. Yep, so like an affiliate program? Um, uh, not really. I mean, affiliate program typically is, is when affiliate marketers will, will promote Jazz HR um, to their customers or whatever the company is they're working. Um, and then if one of their customers comes in and buys from us, um, uh, great, they are, they're paid for doing that. Um, our yeah. customers, uh, our channel partners in most cases are actually reselling Jazz HR themselves. So, okay. they, they, so, so it's a, it's a little more of a, of a deeper dive relationship than a pure affiliate program. Um, so for example, um, we won uh, ADP's new partner of the year last year. So they've got 850,000 small business customers. ADP um, recognizes the value and, and, and the importance of recruiting. They offer Jazz HR to their customers um, and, they, and it's a resell relationship. So in this case, they are actually the ones who are selling Jazz HR to their customers. So there, the benefit to ADP's customers is it's a one-stop shop. They can come to ADP for payroll and all the other wonderful things that ADP provides. And in the mm -hmm. same place, they can purchase Jazz HR through their relationship with ADP. Okay. Uh, what percentage of your customers come from direct versus channel? So today we're about 57% direct, 43% okay. indirect or channel. Um, I will say that the, the, the channel piece of our business is growing faster. So while it's still the smaller of the two, it's the, it's the faster growing. Well, sure. If you can acquire customers in swaths, but right. I would imagine landing a channel partner like ADP is no small feat. It takes some time. Um, we actually have, we have, uh, if you will, two flavors of ice cream of, of, of channel partners. We have you know, large strategic partners like an ADP or, or others would be Zenefits, namely, um, uh, a division of Intuit. Um, so those kind of partners that are big, large companies do take some time and some care and some feeding and some investment in the partnership because, because um, they're betting on us as much as we're betting on them and, 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 um, and appropriately that, that relationship and that trust takes time to develop. And the other type of partner we have are smaller, more local, regional um, uh, HR tech or HR providers. So think um, PEOs, benefits brokers, HR, uh, uh, HR consultants, um, 
smaller uh, uh, payroll companies. And so those are, we have several hundred of those and those are typically quicker relationships to develop. They may not have the, the reach of someone like uh, an ADP or an Intuit, um, but we have a large number of them and they're important. You know, many small businesses look to their local communities for their, for their own needs. And so it's important that we're there as well uh, as the, our more larger strategic relationships. So we're equally committed to both. So on the direct side, if we may, I'd love to talk about, you know, I want to get in the weeds, as I said earlier. So let's start off with most effective direct customer acquisition system. What does that look like? So we use an inbound model, um, meaning we, we market through, through digital and other means um, with the goal of you know, first introducing our target audience to Jazz HR. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of this, that, that most companies have sort of, we'll call it a homegrown recruiting solution in place. In fact, it's 86% have a homegrown recruiting solution in place, which means they, are, they may not necessarily be aware of what an applicant tracking system is or a recruiting solution such as Jazz HR or our competitors. So we start with education and, and helping them understand that, that they likely have a problem that they don't even know they have, which is they're spending a lot of time unnecessarily on recruiting, especially the, in, the administrative pieces where a, a very affordable solution can eliminate all that busy work for them. Um, so that's done through webinars and eBooks and general advertising and all the things you might imagine. Um, but ultimately the goal is to get them to start a, a free trial with us or request a product demonstration. And that's sort of where the magic starts to happen. So we drive them into um, a free trial, uh, hopefully, or a demo request. Uh, our sales team then takes it from there and our marketing team and, and, and our, uh, whether it's a free trial or a demonstration, you'll hear from one of our salespeople who hopefully will guide you through the process and show you some of the, the features and functionality that will, and, and the overall solution that will result in this kind of better, feaster, better, faster, cheaper, um, hiring experience. Yeah. And, um, uh, the, our free trial lasts about 21 days and um, we've got pretty good conversion rates to come out the back end and uh, and we go from there. So it, it, then it just becomes a volume game of managing your funnel from, from uh, you know, how many folks, how many qualified prospective buyers can we get into the top of the funnel? How can we be as helpful as we can be through the process so that, so that some reasonable period of time later, um, uh, they're a happy Jazz HR customer. And so it's what we call sales assisted um, mm -hmm. customer or prospective customers can go through the trial experience with, without talking to a salesperson. If they choose to do that, that's completely fine. It's up to them. Um, but we'll try and, and we'll try and assist and answer questions as you go. And, and we find that, that um, having someone, having a salesperson available to answer questions and, and show off different pieces of functionality that a, that a prospective buyer may not, find on their own is a helpful part of the, the, uh, the process and helps improve conversion rates. What is your AL? I'm curious when, when I, when I hear you talking about salespeople, I think a lot of high touches, I think expenses, what do you use? What does your AOV and LTV look like to be able to pay for that sales team? Yeah. So our, um, our AOV is about, uh, $2,400 on an annual basis. Um, obviously $200 a month. Um, and our LTV is about $11,000. So, and, and, and LTV is, is really the North star of our company. I mean, when we're, when we're selling the average customer spends $2,400 with Jazz HR and we're grateful for every one of them, but nobody's getting rich off of $2,400. We need a lot of them and we need to ensure they stay with us, which is why we focus. You know, I said earlier that perhaps the most important metric we have is is retention, and that's because of the point you just brought up, which is driving LTV. Um, we need our customers to, to to stick with us for a long time, and that that's that ultimately that's how the math works, and that's that's what drives the enterprise value of the company. So early on in our chat, our chat, you said people could, you know, you're very price focused. It's one of your competitive advantages, and people can start using your app for, I think you said, thirty nine bucks a month. How do you get from thirty nine bucks a month to a twenty four hundred dollar AOV? What happens there? So we have three different plans, um, uh, call it good, better, best, if you will. Um, 
which is we call them the, the here the names are hero plus and pro and hero is designed for that company generally with with 50 or 60 and under employees where it's a lightweight recruiting solution that doesn't have all the bells and whistles that a, a slightly larger company might require and that's the the, the product that sells for 39 dollars a month um i think it's 49 if you want to go month to month i think it's 39 on an annual contract uh then our next product is our plus product and that has as you might imagine more features and functionality and so forth more bells and whistles it's designed for a slightly larger company it's it's a little better for uh, folks that have companies that have hiring teams as opposed to just you know one person who's making who's doing the interview and making the decision um that sells for if i recall correctly uh and uh, is about 200 dollars a month um and then our pro product which is full functionality full feature um really designed for businesses with let's say 150 or more employees um that's priced at a little over 300 dollars per month so the averages of those three is it, 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 kind of right in the middle. Okay. And judging from your AOV and your LTV, customers are staying for four and some years. Why Why the drop off, do you think? Like, why, um, why don't they stay for five or for so six? Our, or our, uh, yeah, our, so we our, our annual retention rate um, is about 85%. Um, okay. And the majority of those are, a, a lot of them are companies that get bought or you know, we sell to a market segment that has, you know, a, a, some percentage of those companies go out of business every year. So, so, so a, a big piece of that is simply the companies that, that no longer are in existence, either because they went out of business uh, or they were acquired. I want to see if we can unpack a little bit more the inbound marketing. And obviously, I know you're not the entire marketing department, and, and you may not be able to answer some of the questions I'm going to ask. And if that's the case, fine, we'll just skip on past them. So you said you're largely inbound focused, and you're doing uh, webinars, and you're doing um, things to drive leads. So content marketing, traditional SEO focused blogging, is that a big part of it? Um, it's certainly, we absolutely focus on blogging. And and so there's a, a, a Jazz HR blog you can visit today. Um, and, and SEO, not just for blogging, but for our entire website, certainly is an important part of what we do. And do you have any idea how many posts per week your team is publishing? Uh, I, I'm gonna quickly get out over my skis on this, but I, I think we do approximately one new blog post per week, but I, I, I would not, don't quote me on that. Okay. Directionally, you that's about what we do. Okay. Do you know anything about the process by which that they promote the posts? Are they running ad campaigns? Are they doing retargeting? Are they doing like what other activities are they doing? Yeah, a lot of it. Um, we're, we're pretty active on social media, you know, and, and you know, all, all the places you might expect and, and LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and so forth. And, and a lot of our blog posts um, are mentioned there. We also do with, with our customers, with, with our um, uh, prospective customers in our database, We'll do active nurture campaigns to them as well, and that's that's several hundred thousand small businesses. Um, uh, and as we have content, relevant content to share with them, we promote it to those folks as well. So, you know, nurturing um, businesses that have raised their hand and expressed interest previously but not yet purchased is another part of how we'll, we drive inbound traffic. Okay, so I'm guessing tofu, top of funnel, you've got all highly educational content, not brand specific at all. It's all floating around on the internet. People are finding it in search. They're seeing it on social. They're seeing an ad yep. and they're thinking, hey, that, that ebook or that webinar looks cool to me. I'm going to come sign up for that thing. Now they're entering into the funnel. So mofu, middle of the funnel. So in the middle of the funnel, you're starting to maybe talk about your brand, some of your differentiators a bit more and Correct. encouraging the book a call with a salesperson to get a demo or something like that. Yep, that's right. Okay. Um, what's the sales team look like? How many people are on it? We've got a bit uh, the total sales team, both direct and indirect is about 20 people. Okay. We are total and employee base is 80. If that just for a point of reference. Okay. And those are all folks uh, who, especially now in the middle of COVID are all sitting in their houses, talking in front of their computer, doing demos all day long, every day. We are 100% working from home, which is a switch for us because we have historically been uh, the opposite of that. We have very much been a, we want everybody in the office. It's how we drive organizational and institutional learning. You know, you, yep. you may, uh, especially in sales, you know, I may hear how you explain something to a customer and say, boy, I like that. And I'm going to try that the next time I'm on a phone with a, when a similar question comes up. And so having people physically in their offices 
has been a really important part of our culture and 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 we you know we we've, we've had a really good four year run in terms of driving growth and I think that's been a, a, a part of the reason why it's been an important contributor to our success. Um, so now we've been home for about two months, maybe a little more than that. I think March 16th, yeah, so two and a half months we've been home now. And it was something I was concerned about um, in terms of how we would perform, not just sales, but all of us. And I've been really, really pleasantly surprised. Um, um, uh, you know, we are, everyone's, first, everybody's safe and healthy, and that's what matters most. Um, and, and secondly, the team is, dedicated and focused and committed and our results have been far better than what I might have thought as a company that sells a recruiting solution at a time when we're knocking on the door of 20% unemployment in the United States um, and we happen to sell into the market that has been the most impacted by this downturn small businesses and our, you know our new business isn't what it was pre-COVID but it's performing very very well so we're we're still growing as a company, so we're pleased. And 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 to be able to do this in a remote environment is uh, it's been wonderful to see. Really gratifying. So I have the opportunity, obviously, as a host of a podcast, to get to talk to a lot of different folks, a lot of different CEOs. And you know, much like you, I I used to believe that everybody needed to be under the same roof. And as a result of the many interviews that I've done with folks that have been running really profitable, fast growing software companies where nobody ever came to the office. As a matter of fact, there is no office. I've completely shifted and I would never, ever have an office ever again. Um, has this experience with COVID, I mean, you just said, Hey, things went way better than I expected. Mm -hmm. Are you, do you think that you're going to stay remote or do you think that when, when health conditions allow, you're going to go back to the way that was before? Yeah. So, so preface it, let, let's just say for the purpose of this conversation, it's when there's no health issues left. You know, there's, we get to that place we all can't wait for, which is the vaccines are out and, and everybody's healthy. So there's literally no risk because nothing, nothing, we wouldn't change that. We wouldn't move away from where we are now completely if, if there's any health risk at all. But for the purposes of this question, let's say we're there. Um, and it's, it's an open question. I don't know the answer to that, um, which is actually a big shift from where we've been because again, up until... March 16th, if you worked for Jazz HR, you were in the office every day, you know, unless it was one of those situations where, you know, the plumber's coming or the cable guy's coming or my daughter's got to play, I got to go to, that, you know, we weren't draconian about it, but you had to be in the office. Um, certainly, this is something we're going to look at. Um, I think we have to. And I think that um, um, while I do think that our being in the office um, was a contributor by no means the only thing but has been a, a, an important contributor to the success we've enjoyed over the last four years um uh, i think there's more than one way to skin a cat and certainly I, I think this is something we'll look at hard for when when that day does come and and it wouldn't surprise me if there were changes in how we operated i don't think we go to the extreme of not having offices i that is i, I couldn't imagine as well I, but but i think that there may be some changes in we, we will look at, at changes for how, with, with the frequency with which employees need to come to work every day, physically in the office. Yep, okay. So you mentioned something interesting that I also, we, we didn't cover this in the pre-interview, but I do wanna go down the rabbit hole just a little bit. You're selling into a 20% unemployment market and the right. sector of the market that you sell to has been among the hardest hit. So you've obviously, had to make some changes, I'm guessing, in how you're marketing and how you're selling, or maybe you haven't, I'm not sure, and this is why I'm asking the question, to adapt to the, the reality of COVID and what's going on in the world these days. I'm curious as to what that looks like. We have made changes. And again, I, I, uh, I give all the credit to our, our marketing and sales teams for, for making that pivot. But um, if you, you know, our new business, for example, in May is going to be about 75% of what it was pre-COVID. So, you know, certainly down significantly, but I mean, there was a period in April when it was, things were really kind of dark and I'd, be, I'd get up in the morning and just think, you know, who the hell is waking up today saying, you know what I'm going to go do today? I'm going to go buy recruiting software, you know, and, and, and uh, but they are. And so our, 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 our team has shifted into focus on areas 
where there is recruiting happening. So, and where you, if you look at our, our new subscribers, it ends up kind of making sense. So it's a lot of healthcare. Um, and healthcare is a very broad industry. So in kind of all aspects of healthcare, um, logistical and supply chain management has been a, a big area of hiring for us. Again, you would expect that. I mean, there's a huge shift in how Americans and, 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 and all over the world, how people procure and have, have goods delivered to their homes. Um, um, so those are two big ones. Manufacturing has continued to be strong. Um, technology has continued to be strong and, and it's, and it's all in areas where, where we are still all as a nation consuming. Um, we consume differently and other areas are, uh, have certainly dropped, um, you know, retail and restaurants where we don't have a huge footprint, but, uh, some you might expect, as you might expect, those are, are certainly down from where they were. Um, but but have been offset by areas where we're seeing growth. So we're encouraged with that. And then the second thing that's happened that's been really encouraging is, is um, on the retention side, um, we, we offer the ability for our customers to, to effectively suspend their account if they're not hiring. Mm -hmm. um, we call it hibernate. And it's so, yep. and, and, in April, we had a lot of accounts that called us and, and went into hibernate mode for reasons you, you'd expect. You know, we're just plain not going to be hiring for a while. So yeah. we like our Jazz HR relationship. We don't want to lose all the, all the customization and configuration we, we've put in place. And we want to hang on to all those candidates that are in our database, but we're not going to be hiring for a couple of months. Um, and, and we saw a, a good amount of that in April. In May, um, that number, the, that number of, of customers that have reached out to suspend their accounts, it hasn't, it dropped completely to pre-COVID levels, but really, really close to it. Um, so what was a, a high volume of calls in April with people suspending their accounts or hibernating their accounts is, is almost now back to normal here at the end of May. So I, I think that's, um, probably reflective of what's going on as the, as the states start to open up more and, and, yep. and business begins to come back online. I, I do think we're at the, um, at the whim of what happens with, with healthcare headlines and it doesn't seem like it's happening so far, but if there is a resurgence in, in infection rate or, or, or God forbid death rate, um, we may see uh, um, a drop in some of the trends we've been, experiencing for the last month or so since April ended, but right now we feel good. So I want to shift. Um, thank you for answering that, by the way. And I want to shift back to pricing. You mentioned again, price being one of your competitor competitive advantages. And the reason I'm asking this is again, somewhat selfish. We're going through a, a pricing investigation on our own for our mm -hmm. SAS at this point in time. How did you, cause there's, if you Google, you know, SAS pricing, there's a lot of content on how to do it and how to do it right. And there's yeah. lots of ways to do it wrong. And there's all sorts of second and, and third order unintended consequences. And it's a complicated yeah. topic. And we could probably talk for two hours just on pricing, which we don't have time to do today. How did you determine, at least at the high level, or as best you can answer us in a relatively short period of time, how did you determine pricing? Yeah, so um, you start off with a few sort of sacred tenants. Um, like we knew we wanted to compete on price. Um, and we felt that we had the structure to do that internally. We're, we're a fairly frugal company ourselves, so we didn't have huge overheads. So we felt like we were positioned to be able to compete on price versus some of our competitors that had, had built larger infrastructure. Um, so he said, all right, that's gonna be one of our, our, our competitive advantages. And then uh, it was a lot of market research um, and trial and error. And so we would reach out to prospective customers and current customers and get their feedback, which is, I always find it's a little bit tricky because, you know, when you say, would well, you want A or B? And, and yes, there's ways to do it where, where, where you can guide them as effectively as you can to get honest answers. But my, my thought is, well, of course, people are always going to want the lower price. I mean, yeah. So you got to be careful of that as best you can. Um, but it was a lot of market research and then we would roll out um, and iterate. And I can't tell you how many internal 
staff meetings, uh, some uh, passionate and heated and emotional about on this topic. And we still have them. Like, we, you know, I don't claim that we have it exactly right. Um, but we ended up where we ended up as a result of, of kind of those different mechanisms. And then another thing that we added, which was all part of really focusing on customers was um, one of the things we were concerned about was an ability to like, let's say you're in our plus product, which goes for about $200 a month. Um, mm -hmm. And, but to bump up to our pro, it's, a little over a hundred dollar a month increase, twelve hundred dollars a year for a small business. That could be a lot of money, and that could, and mm -hmm. and we didn't want. We were concerned that that's too big a jump from one to the other. So what we have also done is we've made we've constructed Jazz HR to be modular, so that generally you, what we do is we allow. Let's say there's one you're in, in the plus, which is the mid level plan, and there's one thing you really like in the pro, but gosh, I don't want to spend $1,200 a month, or $1,200 a year more for that one thing. So um, we allow you to purchase add-ons. So you can purchase, you can purchase kind of one piece of pro, might up your bill from 200 bucks a month to 250 or 60 or less or more, kind of depending on which one it is. Yeah. But, yeah. but there's add-on modular functionality as well. And generally speaking, once you're going to add that second piece of functionality, you're probably just better off to, to upgrade and, and purchase yep. a pro at that point in this example. Yep. Um, but that modular functionality has helped as well. So, um, so add-on sales are, are a, a third leg of the stool for us, or we call it expansion revenue. So you've got, you know, the, the, the three legs of the stool are you've got new business, um, you've got gross retention and you've got expansion revenue. And, and expansion revenue is selling more the same people. things, more solutions into our base, right? Yeah. So into our 6,000 customers, how do we get them to purchase more things? And, and ultimately, the nirvana goal that we're working towards is net negative churn. Um, yeah. So that, you know, if we didn't add a dime of new business in a, in a period of time, the top line would still grow because our existing customer base is consuming additional pieces of functionality sufficient to offset the loss of uh, normal churn MRR that that, all, that that heads out the door at any SaaS model. So so we're not there yet, but we've made really good progress. And and what's kind of nice about the the journey towards net negative churn is that even if you don't get there, you know, let's say you get halfway there, well, boy, you've made a big impact on your LTV still. So, oh, yeah. so, you know, we hold that out as, as the goal we want to get to, we launched this actually almost a year ago, our, our expansion revenue strategy launched at the end of Q2 in 2019. Um, so we've made great progress, um, but uh, a long way to go still. And how do you sell it? Are there notifications in app or is it just the sales teams making calls? So it's, um, uh, it's a combination of lifecycle marketing, which is in app and, and email and newsletters and all those sort of things that go out to our, our, uh, our existing customer base. And then we've got a dedicated team, um, uh, a sales team that does nothing but work with existing customers to, to, to address the demand that, that, um, that our marketing to our existing base covers. Yep. Okay. Makes perfect sense. Uh, you talked earlier about the importance of the customer experience and obviously onboarding is a huge part of customer experience because if you can't onboard them, they don't stick around. Well, yep. you know, money wasted. Um, what are some of the lessons that you have learned in uh, onboarding new customers? Yeah. I mean, you just said that the, 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 you just said our strategy, which is if renewal, if gross retention and renewals is, is maybe the most important metric we have, that starts with onboarding. You know, we, we are the, the reason we focus so much on onboarding is because of the gross retention. And, and the key thing for us is that, is that we don't want to be that subscription and every business has them that they purchase and then they don't use, or they use 10% of. So we, we really want our customers to understand how easy jazz HR is to use to the point where we don't charge for onboarding. Like a number of, of our competitors um, 
or as, as is common in the in the SaaS industry, um, you purchase a subscription, then you've got to pay for you know that initial onboarding or, or getting kind of up and running with that particular solution. We don't charge a dime for that. Um, um, we will invest several hours with you and and your with whoever the person who purchases and their hiring team or their HR team, whoever they want to show them how to use Jazz HR and how easy it really is. Um, I think for us, the magic really happens when they post their first job through Jazz HR, because then it switches from academic to real life. So during the onboarding process, we'll say, hey, let's take an open rec you have right now. Let's get it posted. Let's get it live. And, and all of a sudden, real candidates start flowing in and they can see how easy it is to parse resumes based on search criteria or you know, the bane of every hiring manager's existence is you want to bring Mary, the awesome candidate in for an interview with a four person hiring team. But, but finding a day when everyone's calendar is free so that Mary can come in is a freaking goat rodeo, right? It's always impossible. Well, um, through our calendarization, you press a button and you can see, okay, everyone's free next Tuesday, including Mary done. And it's, it's one button press and it's done in 60 seconds or less. So things like that, you get these delighters that, that drive adoption. And then once they are a customer, we, we look at product utilization metrics every single week. We want to make certain that our customers are using um, what we believe are the single biggest customer delighters. Uh, to an, and, and the whole point is we want them to have a great experience. We want them to feel like they've got their money's worth, that we're really helping them recruit. But then selfishly, we know that drives retention as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. So I tell you, man, I'm really enjoying it. I say, I'm really enjoying this interview. I'm getting, a, I'm, I'm typing notes like Matt. I'm getting, yeah. a, I'm getting pretty, pretty well, I think it's, you know, content. it's, um, it's, it's, if LTV is the North star to spend a few extra bucks making delighting customers in onboarding is it's money well spent. Do you have any idea how your LTV compares to the industry? I don't. Okay, because nobody's publishing that number. I'm no, guessing. no. I mean, we're pretty open about kind of all metrics around here, as you can see. But, but um, yep. I don't have a sense of that. Okay. So, last topic um, is around processes. Folks who've been listening to my show for a while know that I'm a complete process nerd. I have a process for literally everything that I do in all three of my companies, um, and that's why I only really have to work in one of them because we've got great teams and we've got great processes, and everybody knows what to do and how to do it. What does that look like in your organization? And by processes, just to give a, a, a to couch my comments or my question, what I'm what I mean is, we have written processes, checklists, basically that live in our own software application. For like like a podcast episode has 92 steps, and so there's all different people on the team that handle the steps, and that way we know that it gets done the right way every single time consistently. And if one of those people needs to go, then we can re relatively easily replace them because of the fact we don't require this massive amount of training because we have these really great processes. What does that look like in your shop? So um, I think it varies team by team. And, and we're also, which is somewhat by a, a combination of by necessity and by happenstance. And by the necessity, I'm Maybe that maybe that kind of the, the the tables are turning now in this conversation where I'm going to learn from you. But I, I think out of necessity, um, that makes sense. Like we have customers that one customer's burn a buying journey on the sales side may be very different from another's, and so it requires us to be more flexible and almost perhaps flowcharty, if you will, in terms of you know if then and yes and no and and how we respond to each cus prospective customer's journey. In other parts of the business, such as engineering. Um, it's more, I don't want to use the word rigid, but more set. Whereas, you know, how the steps we go through to, to conduct a, a release of whatever functionality is or, or, or whatever it is that we're releasing, those are generally the same every single time. So there's a process we go through there. Um, and then I, I think that an, an area that we need to be better at, candidly, and this is something we've had a lot of discussion on this year, is is proper uh, process and business operations, and I think that um, um, not having proper processes um, or or an awareness where process is required is probably maybe even a better way to put it has at times gotten us into trouble and caused some internal 
friction and unhappiness when if you look back on it with hindsight, it was probably avoidable. So this is something we're trying to invest more in now. Okay. Very good. In the interest of time, um, we are going to wrap here. This has been an absolutely fantastic interview. I want to thank you very much for making time for, and I didn't discuss this uh, with you beforehand, but I always like to give my guests who've given value to my audience an opportunity. If you have a a promo code or a special or any type of something or other that you want to offer anyone who's listening to this who might want to try your software after the fact, if you want to give that to me, I'll make sure that it is in the show notes. Generally, it's a link to a special landing page specifically Great. tailored for my audience or what have you. If there's anyone listening to the show who wants to potentially become a channel partner is if you could also provide me after the fact, um, either a link or a name or something, and I'll put that in the show notes, because I'd obviously like to, you know, if there's an opportunity to turn this episode into a little bit of a lead generator for you, because great. you have been gracious in answering all my questions and educated both myself and my audience, I like to reciprocate wherever I can. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Been a pleasure to have you on the show. I thought it was great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.